Thanks very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be here in Ottawa. Um, I do come quite frequently through here, so I'm delighted about the visit. Um, and as you see, there's no snow in Vancouver. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to talk to you today about some of our strategies that we have used to increase upper and lower physical activity uh, after stroke. And in terms of the site, I'm located at GF Strong Rehab Center, which is uh, the largest rehab center in the province. We have spinal cord injury. I actually do quite a bit of spinal cord as well as stroke. We also have arthritis and neuromuscular um, rehabilitation. Our stays is typical of what happens in Canada with stroke. Typically one to two weeks uh, in acute stay. Then they get transferred over to GF Strong. Three to four weeks, that's shortening maybe towards three. Uh, and then a small proportion receive outpatient therapy but we actually have about a two-month wait list. So not that many individuals get outpatient rehab. Uh, and so what I wanted to talk to you today is about what is the current intensity of rehabilitation practice and what kind of strategies can we use to increase that intensity to be effective in today's rehabilitation setting. And I, I really emphasize that today because part of my work is really about implementation and trying to develop interventions that we can then take directly into practice and have them certainly seen to be done. So just starting out with upper extremity, certainly I think there's a number of basic uh, scientists here and they're able to answer these type of questions better than myself, but how many upper extremity reps per day can positively change the brain after stroke? And I think most of us in this audience would say a lot. Now, it really depends on the literature that you look at, but you know, some of the literature have said you know, 600 to 100 successful reach and grasp per day are needed to really induce neuroplasticity. Successful meaning that if you drop it, that doesn't count, so uh, really the number of actual attempts is even much higher. And in these types of study, they have shown really remarkable results where the hand representation within the primary motor cortex is regained. They've seen uh, changes in the functional reorganization and even progressing from really quite gross motor grip to more fine precision grip. So we know this from the animal models that there is a lot. We don't really know the exact number. I mean, they haven't tried 500, 400, 1200, but we do know that hundreds, if not thousands, of repetitions per day are really needed. Now, we've done a couple studies looking at imaging um, with uh, functional magnetic uh, resonance imaging, fMRI. And we use here uh, a bracelet, which is an Actical bracelet. It was actually developed for sleep monitoring than activity monitoring. Uh, and it provides you with the number of activity counts as you move there your arm. It doesn't really provide anything if you actually just move the fingers, which is a, a major disadvantage of that. Uh, we're trying to develop a device right now that can both detect reaches and actually hand opening and closing. Uh, and we think that would be something a bit more useful. But in this case, we looked at the arm use over weeks period of time with them wearing the Actical. And then we also put these stroke patients into the MRI uh, unit where we actually had them squeeze, and this is a really low tech, it's a turkey baster, and had them squeeze the turkey baster, and we looked at their brain activation. And we compared that with their actual activity. And what we actually found is that if you don't use your predic hand, um, we actually found that you start to compensate more with the unaffected hemisphere. What was really interesting is that these correlations did not relate to arm function. So your typical test, box and block, or seeing what they do on that instant in the day. It was more reflective of what you do over time, and in this case, it's use. And we know that for many of our patients, they come out of rehabilitation, and particularly if, it's their, if they were right hand dominant, but it's their left hand that is affected, they may not always go back to using 
their hand on a regular basis. They may actually have good function, but they don't go on to actually use that hand. So something like the accelerometer is actually telling us, do they actually use the hand? And I actually see that's a major difference in where our field is going. We focused a lot on outcome measures. Here, let's do a two-minute test and see what you can actually do. What we really need to figure out is, you know, how much are you actually using your hand? How much are you actually walking in the community? As opposed to that single instant of gate speed that happens, and that may not be actually reflective of how much they walk in the community. And I see that as a major shift coming down the pipeline in rehabilitation research as well as in practice. So how many repetitions are actually being done? This was a study by Catherine Lang from the US, but she actually used uh, GF Strong as one of her sites. So we were the actually only Canadian site, and the rest are, were American. And um, they looked at uh, repetitions, and they actually had uh, observers who sat in the corner and looked at what the uh, physical therapist and the occupational therapist were doing and counted them and categorized them per session over the rehabilitation stay. So as I said, you know, there generally is about a three to four week stay where you're recovering. And they found that during the OT sessions, there was about 41 upper extremity functional repetitions. And in the PT session, there was about 12 upper extremity functional repetitions. And if you go back to that original slide with the animal one, I, how many repetitions did that slide say was necessary? So about 600 repetitions. So we're really, really short of the number of repetitions that need to be done. So, Obviously, we have a ways to go to figure out how to get those repetitions in. Uh, we know arm activity is low. So this is a study uh, my postdoc, Debbie Rand, did with me. Uh, again, we used the ActiCal um, accelerometer, and we looked at the changes that happen in physical therapy and occupational therapy. So on admission, and about four weeks later on discharge. Uh, so there's a couple things that are happening. One is we're seeing in physical therapy that between admission and discharge, there is really no change. Uh, and you would expect that individual is getting better, getting better function, might be doing more. Um, and you would think in occupational therapy as well. There is a small change, but really it is very small in the, the magnitude. One of the problems with the arm activity counts is they're not very functional. We do have normative values as well. If you look at their whole day, we have uh, the counts are on the left there, about 6,000. Uh, if we look at age match controls, um, they are about three times as much. Now, I think what is really, really important to remember is that there are a lot of things to do in therapy. It is not that the therapists are, are trying to rehabilitate their patients. They are trying to rehabilitate them as best they can. And it, you know, I was a frontline therapist, both an OT and a PT, and come from that background. And you are working on gait. You are working on executive function and cognition. You're working with the family. You're working with orthoses. You're working with pain. And it goes on and on and on. And yet, by the time that patient comes down and gets in and whatnot, you have about 45 to maybe at most one hour, that's quite unlikely, to work with that patient. And in fact, most centers now only work four days because five days might be for home visits and other things that you might need to do. So we have a system that is very constraining in what we do, and we really need to think outside the box of how we can do more. And I really don't think loading on more within that one hour is going to work because there are so many other things that need to be done within rehabilitation. We really need to think of a different model of how we can increase intensity. So just talking about some of the upper extremity uh, trials. So this was uh, one of the programs we developed a few years ago. Um, Jocelyn Harris was my doctoral student, is now a um, professor at McMaster, assistant professor. And we knew that intensity is important, but wanted to come up with a different model of how we could increase it without increasing the burden on our therapists uh, and also increasing costs. Because we do know there's a number of other things we could do uh, that 
could be done outside, which could be expensive. And we wanted to keep this low resource. So we took uh, patients uh, from four rehab centers in BC. We admitted them to inpatient rehab, consecutive patients, no more than four weeks post-stroke. And we put them and guided them through a self-directed arm and hand homework program. The therapist taught them at the beginning, checked on them about 10, 15 minutes every week. But the, th uh, the patients did the program with their family uh, outside of therapy, in the evenings, after dinner, in between therapy time. Uh, it came with an exercise book and a kit, and also came with a log sheet to track the number of minutes that they did each day. The target was supposed to be about an hour. Our control group uh, received uh, the same amount of attention, but actually had an educational program. So it to talked about bone density, talked about pain management, things like that. These are some of the pictures uh, from the GRASS uh, program. Uh, range of motion, strengthening, weight bearing, functional tasks. They are really not any different from standard of care practice. These are all things that are done in current practice today. Um, but we really try to package it, trying to bring forward what we thought was the best uh, types of tasks. I know people have substituted for other tasks. But I think if you keep the combination of particular uh, components, I think you would likely be successful as well. So I don't think they're magical in the types of the things that we put together, but it was uh, logical of what we put together. These are some of the outcomes uh, that uh, we received. The grass group is in blue. Uh, at admission and control, they're approximately the same, but at four weeks, uh, the grass group was uh, greater and continue to improve about five to six months uh, post-stroke. And this is using the Shadok Arm and Hand Activity Index, which looks, looks at very, very functional tasks. So things like taking a lid off of a jar, doing up buttons, uh, putting toothpaste on a toothbrush. We also have uh, changes in other measures, such as the Action Research Arm Test. We did that because that test is done a lot in the US. Uh, we wanted to be able to compare our results, so the grass was greater, as well as grip strength. And the motor activity log has a component called the amount of use, so how much they're actually using their hand. It's self-report, but prov provides some measure of use. So grass is an uh, inexpensive method to improve upper limb function. It's uh, safe and effective and promotes uh, limb use. Uh, helps to foster some of the self-management issues start thinking the patient and their family about how they can then take something into the community and continue it. And that was really important that it actually included the family within the treatment program. Uh, we now have it uh, translated in a number of languages. We have uh, posted the one in French. Uh, it is used uh, uh, in China, in Sweden. It's, and actually, it's, most of the translations have come from people who've actually sent them to me. So someone from Israel sent me a Hebrew uh, version. I hope it's correct, <laughs> because I then posted it. Uh, so that's been uh, fantastic to, to do. We've also uh, published other papers looking at uh, the caregiver assistance. And if you control the model for the starting impairment, those that had caregiver assistance had better outcomes. Now, we actually know that from the literature as well. Um, but there is an interaction that those that have caregiver assistance tended to do more hours of the grass. So there's an interaction between there. And I think that is something we haven't tapped into, is, is, is really uh, utilizing the caregivers within the treatment of our patients as well. And many caregivers are looking for something to do. They, they just don't know what they can do. So I think this provides one solution for them. So the Canadian Stroke Guidelines now recommend a supplementary uh, arm and hand program to be undertaken uh, with evidence provided by the GRASS multi-center trial. Uh, we are also um, working at uh, developing uh, videos with the GRASS uh, to translate it uh, more to clinicians. Um, and it now has been, I mean, we have a website. When people download the program, we email them back and ask them, have they implemented it? We have now about uh, over 500 sites that have said they implemented it. Um, 
One of my postdocs uh, from the UK has done a survey of the UK PTs and OTs. She sent out to the list of all registered UK therapists, and about 20% were actually using it, about 50% knew about it. Um, this was developed in 2009, and that's an incredible fast translation. If any of you are familiar with knowledge translation, it can take decades to get something into practice. So I know certainly in the UK and Australia, because they are English-speaking languages, the uptake has been really, really fast. Uh, and I think it's in part because it works, and also because um, it is fairly low resource. There are still issues. Um, some of the studies that we will have coming out will talk about the translation and the problems. Uh, we've interviewed numbers of people who tell me they're using GRASS, but not using it to how I imagined it. And so they give it to the patient, but don't do any follow-up. They do give it to the patient and don't look at progression or try to progress the exercises. And to me, that won't work. There are parts of the grass that are absolutely essential. And I think we need to think about when we translate things, what are the essential ingredients where grasp is grass, or if you do it, it doesn't become grasp any longer. Those are kind of issues that we need to explore because this whole knowledge translation research is really on the forefront. And we haven't learned, you know, if we put something out there, just because it gets taken up, are they actually doing it so that it is going to be effective as well? There's a whole a gap in that type of research that we need to look into. Now, we've actually, years ago, I actually looked at um, uh, intensive exercises more with, more with chronic patients. And this actually study fed into the types of interventions that we then developed for GRASS. This was a study uh, developed by uh, my postdoc, Marco Pang, who's now full professor, actually, at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, and it was one time, three, uh, one hour, three times a week for five months. Uh, community uh, living with stroke. It was a randomized controlled trial. It was a group program uh, for people. And it was actually a circuit program that we did. What we actually found uh, with our um, exercise arm group was that they improved their arm use, looking at motor activity log. Uh, they improved about 1.0 for mild, uh, 0.5 a point for moderate severity. Those that are familiar with the EXCITE constraint-induced therapy trial, they had about a 1.0 change, so somewhat comparable. Um, the grip strength, we had about a 16% improvement. EXCITE had about 25%. And we had done uh, the Wolf motor function tests. And our actually changes were similar to the EXCITE. Now, this program ran over a much longer period of time and much less in terms of three times a week versus doing something like EXCITE for many, many hours, six hours of therapy, plus the use and the constraint of the arm. And I do think there is a, you know, different types of doses, intensity of how we can deliver our programs. Um, this one certainly is easier use in terms of translating and likely being able to get uh, family and caregivers to be involved with it as well. It did have a very uh, strong or, or uh, pro predominant strengthening component with it, which I don't think has been done previously in some of the trials. So some of the, the key issues, uh, intensity is currently low in uh, practice, uh, but we need to look at increasing it with uh, monitoring of the repetitions, uh, the time, perhaps looking at exertion as well. Uh, group programs, I think, are one way to reduce our resources. Uh, circuit programs, like the one I just showed you, Patient-directed uh, programs with caregiver involvement is a another way of looking at this. Uh, we actually have a GRASS program right now running uh, a, a very small, kind of a case series group running in our Abbotsford uh, site. And in this program, we really are emphasizing goal planning. So we are asking our patients, you know, how much are you using your hand? These patients, unlike the GRASS, are actually um, outreach, uh, they have been discharged, um, but recently discharged, so they're not receiving therapy. Uh, so they are three months and beyond. And uh, because they're living at home, I really wanted to emphasize um, how they integrate the use of the arm within the home. 
So the therapist calls him once a week and says, well, how did you use your arm? Did you use your affected arm brushing your teeth? Did you use your affected arm um, turning on the tap or opening the door? And then they counsel them uh, not only to practice the GRASS program, but then to use that arm in the rest of the day. And I think we have to get beyond therapists see them for one hour and we do this one thing. We need to see how we can influence the patient's function within the contents of the rest of the day. Because that's the only way we're going to figure out how to keep them increasing their function and not decline back. Because the therapist is not always going to be there. So those are some of the strategies we're trying to look at is in, in terms of goal planning and counseling and getting people integrated with their activities of the daily living and integrate whatever we're doing in therapy together. So those are some of the kinds of things that we're trying to do uh, in our upper extremity programs. I'm going to shift a little bit to some of our programs with uh, mobility uh, function. So how many steps does it are required to change the brain? Tens, hundreds, thousands? So thousands, people are saying. So I have to get some help from the basic scientists because I calculated this on my own from this paper. And I really don't know what the step length of a mouse is or rats. And I, I, I tried to calculate it out. So this paper uh, said there was 30 minutes of treadmill running in rats after a stroke. And it increased uh, uptake proteins involved in the synaptic transmission. Well, based on the gait speed that they had, and I kind of thought how long rats were, I calculated it. It was about 4,000 steps per session. It was really challenging my gait background here. So this is really interesting because this is not 4,000 steps over a day. This is 4,000 steps over probably an hour session. I mean, this is a phenomenal amount of intensity. So we'll go back to Catherine Lang's uh, study, which she also, as I said, did at GF Strong uh, as one of the seven sites. Uh, and we'll look at what is done in our inpatient, so first four weeks post-stroke at GF Strong, which I really don't think is any different from uh, the other Canadian sites, and in fact was not different from any of the other six American sites. So there was about 121 steps during OT. OK, because you know OT does a lot of ADL. I wouldn't expect a lot of steps. 370 uh, steps done in uh, physical therapy. If you look at how many steps we need, there is a number of uh, things put out there. But we also, we actually did it with, um, that was observational data where, again, somebody stood in the corner and ticked how many steps they did. Uh, and we found very similar numbers here, uh, physical therapy, three, uh, well, actually about 200 steps, increasing a little bit. Uh, the total day is about 1,000 uh, steps per day. Now, there's been actually uh, different recommendations out based on the pedometer literature. And what, what's the number of steps probably people have heard of? So people, lots of people always hear about the number 10,000. And the 10,000 was not neuroplasticity or brain health. The 10,000 was simply about good health for all populations. They've actually kind of reduced that. They found that 10,000 is probably too difficult for a lot of people to, to reach, particularly older adults. And now you'll see the number 5,000 steps per day. Now, if you look at our people, over the entire day, they were walking about 1,000 steps. Um, and in physical therapy, as I said, about 200 steps. If you take someone who walks very slow with a short uh, step length, someone like stroke walking about 0.5 meters per second, and you have them walk for six minutes, and many of you are familiar with the six-minute walk test. It's a standard test. A six-minute walk test they will generate 500 steps. So our people in physical therapy are not even doing six minutes of walking. That's how little they are stepping. Now, there's many, many reasons for that. And again, I emphasize that rehabilitation and therapy, there are many, many things to do beyond walking as well. And you may be applying electrical modality, functional electrical stim. You may be doing pain management. Uh, your person may not be ambulating, ambulating yet, although body weight support you could, could do as one option. But there are many reasons why we don't see the steps that we hope we should have. 
but we really need to address this. So this is uh, a study um, we've, we've published in an abstract, and we have it hopefully should be in, in uh, press next year. Uh, and this is looking at consecutive patients discharged from two sites in Vancouver. And at zero is the time they're actually ad admitted to uh, uh, either GS Strong or Holy Family. Uh, they increase their steps at the very beginning. Good thing because they are going through rehabilitation and we expect that we would increase the number of steps that they walk uh, through the day. So we put on a step counter, we look at how many steps they do over consecutive days and take that. So this is not just therapy, but it's the entire day, including therapy. Uh, then um, they go home and uh, what we, some of them will receive outpatients. I don't know in this case which ones have, a very small proportion do. Uh, and what we do see is that within the year, we are actually starting to see a decline in the number of steps that they're walking. Now why this is so, uh, is there not uh, avenues available for them for community recreation? Uh, their actual function is actually declining, but within a one-year period, we're seeing any of the gains that we, we got in rehab are actually being lost. And this really brings into the question our model of rehabilitation, which we have, we have put at the front end in the first four weeks. Unlike some other models like cardiac rehab, where the payment model in Canada is such that it's actually spread out over a year. It's not probably as intensive as what we do in stroke, but one has to wonder, you know, if we're losing everything that we gained at the front end, is this the right model that we're doing? And now we're moving into an area where they're getting less walking steps, not getting around, becoming more sedentary, and as many of you know, are apt to have another stroke, a second stroke, because they are not physically active and many of the other things that go together with reduced cardiovascular fitness. So this is another issue we really need to look at is how we are, the payment plan for stroke rehabilitation may not be the ideal type of model um, if we're trying to get people in the end to be physically active, not just in rehab, but well beyond. So what are some of the strategies? I'll talk about um, uh, some of the group programs and one of our trials trying to increase intensity within the rehab standard of practice. So this is a, a program we developed several years ago we called the FAME, the Fitness and Mobility Exercise Program. Uh, it is available on my website, www.neurorehab.med.ubc.ca. And we are actually just working uh, right now with the Heart and Stroke to develop uh, instructor modules to be taught to either uh, fitness instructors or to uh, physical therapists or occupational therapists who might want to deliver the program. So it'll be an online program uh, to deliver that. So we're working with them right now on that. It was developed as a community-based program. Uh, we've run it uh, in many different ways. Um, well, actually, we ran it tw twice a week, but most of the uh, trials were three times a week. The shortest one was uh, 10 weeks. The longest one was a half a year, um, particularly to look at changes such as bone density. Uh, they've all been run as a group program with a ratio of 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 uh, participants to instructors. The components within the FAME program uh, we've had a lot of gait-specific activities are embedded within it. Uh, we also have uh, functional uh, strengthening, for example, getting up and down out of a chair. And I'm a big proponent of functional strengthening. My very, very first randomized controlled trial I ran with my graduate student, um, we did an exercise program looking at uh, a Kincom exercise dynamometer, which pushed up and down, up and down, and they did their hip, knee, and the ankle. The uh, control group just sat on the dynamometer and it went in passive mode, the same movements. Uh, and we found that the stroke group actually improved in strength, which is great. But actually, both groups improved in gait function. Why is that so? Anyone know why both groups would improve in uh, walking speed? They walked into the clinic. All I have to do is put a sign on my door and say, come to my clinic and you will walk faster. Absolutely. 
they had to get to the clinic. They had to arrange their handy dart accessible whatever. They had to park in the parking lot or someone. Then they had to walk into their hospital down the long hallway, whatnot, three times a week. I don't need to have an expensive uh, supervisor, instructor, therapist. I just tell them to come to the hospital. So this is actually why all my trials have some type of match control where we bring them into the clinic. Because that, in it, you know, our people are really sedentary. And you bring them in there in itself, that is an exercise stimulus. So that's why I always have a match control that is coming for some, something. So that was a lesson learned in the very early lesson. Uh, we have, again, functional strengthening, like re rising up on the toes. Um, agility, stepping, so we ask them to step to the right or the left as fast as they can. Uh, and uh, if we have the resources, um, we have some uh, reactive control. Uh, we really try to work on uh, reducing the base of support to challenge that, as well as in uh, proving uh, balance. Almost none of my patients can do one-legged standing. Uh, but it's something we work towards. And moving the head around because we know vestibular function uh, and visual control is, is very much altered uh, with stroke. And your patients will tend to rely on vision much more than healthily older match controls. Uh, stepping, I actually like the stepping not just for agility and obviously uh, practical gait function, but also for repetitive limb loading for the bone density. And we really don't know how much loading or what type of loading can improve bone density. We've looked at the animal models. They say you should do it in spurts and then rest and then spurts and then rest because bone tends to accommodate. Uh, and we really don't have a good prescription of what bone loading should look like for optimal um, remodeling. We have a much better idea of muscle remodeling, but not so much for bone. Uh, and some of our trials have used a cardiovascular component. Not all of them have, because there are issues with stress testing and screening. Uh, so otherwise, they, they work at a moderate intensity. These are just some of the scenes uh, from the fitness and uh, mobility program. This one was run in a gym that we had available. Uh, lots of functional uh, in a group program doing sit to stand. And we really try to make them fun in a group program. And that's seems to be what keeps people coming back. This was actually one of the circuits that we actually ran. Uh, the inside circuit would allow those with lower functioning. These were actually not steps, but actually pieces of tape on the floor where they actually had to step small and move to the larger ones. So people who had a short step length would move along the inside. This again was tape where they had to balance on the tape again so they wouldn't fall off of anything. We had a spotter here as they stepped over something. They walked to a metronome, and they came around the circuit this way. So this one was a, we've run it in many different styles, and we're just trying to write that up to give better people a better idea. Um, depending on the resources, the, not, the, the ratio of people that they have, they may run it as a circuit. You may run it as separate stations as well. But it'll have to accommodate the number of instructors you have for the number of patients that you have. These are some of the improvements. We've run numbers of study uh, from FAME in different church settings, church basements, uh, community centers. In general, the, the balance, because we're working with chronic patients, we see small changes in the Berg balance scale, so two to five points. Um, we have seen improvements in postural reflexes. So I have a, a translating platform that moves. And when it translates, we, we put EMG on the, uh, the, the skin and look at their postural reflexes. And this was actually one of the very few trials that has shown that we can improve balance postural reflexes. So after, in this case, it was a 10-week program. The, um, the FAME group, compared to uh, 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 an active control group, their reflexes were 25 milliseconds faster. And for those of you that are in, in sort of more in the neuroscience, uh, 25 milliseconds is, is as fast as a short latency reflex. And it is very functional uh, amount of change that we saw. And in fact, with that cohort that improved 25 milliseconds, we actually saw that over the next year, those that were in the FAME group fell less. And the control group fell one and a half times more. And really, that is what's significant. I get very excited about the posture reflexes and the fact that we can change. Obviously, I think the changes are happening in the brain, not in, in uh, 
coming between the leg and the spinal cord, I actually think it's the processing of the brain that speeds up. But really, the outcome is if they fall less, which is really critically a clinical significance. Walking distance has improved compared to our, our control groups. We've improved balance confidence, fear of falling, a cardiovascular fitness, um, muscle strength. Now, our longest trial, which was a half a year, uh, showed that we were able to maintain paretic hip density. Well, the control group in that short time lost 3%. So that was really important to uh, know that we can make effects on hip bone density. Quality of life always improves for all of our groups. And that is because our control group, in this, sometimes they're in a, uh, uh, a yoga group, a uh, tai chi group, um, an upper extremity group, but they're always active control groups. Uh, can exercise improve cognition? We've, we're starting to get there, and I have to admit I've had discussions uh, yesterday with Dale. I'm not impressed with our results at this time. Um, we have a feasibility trial. We, we published in Neuro Rehab Neuro Repair that showed some changes. Uh, and uh, my colleague, uh, Teresa Lou Ambrose, took some of my other data, some from an RCT, and looked at it. And we also have a few changes. They're not as robust, and I, I really think um, exercise alone may not be the solution, but we may need to compare it with dual tasks or some other cognitive challenging um, exercises at the same time. Um, but we have, for example, this study uh, looked at um, very standardized tests of memory recall. And at the baseline, um, we asked them to recall words. They were able to recall about five and improved about seven words. Uh, we've also uh, looked at the Stroop test. Some of you have done this one, where you say the color, not the written word. You can try it yourself right now. But this is uh, a test that introduces conflict uh, when you have to resolve uh, conflicting pieces of information. And we've seen uh, the time uh, reduce. So after the trial, they were able to do it faster. But you know, when we actually do cognitive bat batteries, we, we actually do many, many different things. And I haven't found, unlike exercise, if I do an exercise program, we find similarities in our improvements within the six minute walk and the timed up and go and gait speed and anything to do with in the Berg and similar to mobility. And it's very, very robust, the types of changes we get. You know, we've actually, I've shown you two of our batteries. We actually had a huge batteries. And some things change, some things don't change. I have to admit, I'm not confident we're quite in the right direction at this time. But certainly, we're working on it, figure, trying to figure out maybe we need to couple it with uh, cognitive training at the same time with the exercise. I'm not sure. Uh, but certainly, this is a field that many, many of us are interested in. Uh, in terms of group fitness, uh, we've shown uh, that we can improve use of the leg in walking uh, with group programs. We can reduce the effects of secondary complications, such as falls, uh, heart disease, and osteoporosis. Uh, FAME is not used as much as grass. When I, uh, there are a few hundred sites, uh, but less than in uh, the grass program. The reason being is because it's done in chronic. And in, particularly in Canada and many other parts of the world, we don't pay for chronic programs. So this is one, one of the reasons we're trying to, get, we're actually trying to work with the partner with the YMCA to get the uh, online program and then implement it within the YMCA system. Uh, unlike the grass, which runs in the hospital system, there was an immediate stakeholder that could uptake the program. So these are all kinds of things you need to think about knowledge translation. FAME is actually used in a number of people have told me they use it for Parkinson's for older adults. Um, and they find that it is a useful resource. Just lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about physical activity and cardiovascular health before I wrap up. And uh, this was, I think, one of the really fun uh, pieces of data I work with. My postdoc looked at the Canadian Community Health Survey. And here we had 25,000 pieces of data, which is fabulous to work with uh, compared to our usual 60 or 100 or 150 pieces of data. Uh, 1,200 of them had, uh, had a stroke. And when we looked at the data, the people with stroke, compared to all the other chronic diseases, uh, they had the largest percent saying, I did no leisure activity at all, nothing, compared to cardiovascular, neurodegenerative, 
musculoskeletal conditions. At, we know cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in chronic stroke. 75% have heart disease, 85% have hypertension, many, the majority, have impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes, and one third go on to have a stroke within five years. Inactivity and low cardiovascular fitness are modifiable. We can change that um, with exercise. If you look at our cardiovascular training, um, how many minutes is the heart rate within a training zone? So at least 40% heart rate reserve during, let's say, a typical physical therapy session. How many would say greater than 20 minutes? How many say greater than 10 minutes. How many say between 0 and 10? So somewhere in there. Marilyn McKay-Lines, this is one of my favorite studies um, and that she did 2.8 minutes of the physical therapy session uh, was within the training zone, 40%. And they really needed a fast stopwatch because 0.7 minutes of the OT session was in a training zone. So we really not need to start monitoring our patients. And we do, pedometers are not great, but there's lots coming down the pipeline that we can use that are getting many of the new accelerometers. Um, this is a new one that I use, the ePulse. And or this is the ePulse down here. Um, and this is the Mio on the top, which we just bought a whole bunch of Mio. And there are wristwatch monitors. You don't require a heart uh, strap to go around work really, really nice uh, for measuring heart rate. Uh, our patients love these ones. And after our trial, about half of them asked me for it. And they actually, I bought them for them and, they, and uh, sold them to them because they wanted to buy their own personal heart rate monitor. Very, very nice because they just very, very large dial, easy to use. There's many modalities of aerobic activity that we can utilize. Uh, this was a trial that my postdoc, Ada Tang, uh, just published this year. Uh, Ada is now assistant professor at, at uh, McMaster. Uh, and we looked at a six month, uh, three times a week program, uh, looking at uh, Doppler echo uh, cardiography. We were able to improve cardiac structure and function, not just VO2, but look at the right atrial emptoring fraction, ventricular myocardial relaxation, so some of the more uh, um, cardiovascular markers. Uh, as well, we we're able to uh, improve standard uh, cardiovascular indicators such as lipids, glucose, homocysteine levels, which is an inflammatory marker of, of cardiac disease as well. Uh, this one was running on mostly on a stationary recumbent bicycles, uh, but there's many modalities that you can use. Uh, this was one trial that I, I did many years ago. Uh, we ran it at um, a community center looking at uh, water, hopping, running, whatever they could do in the water. These are either a life belt uh, or a life jacket, which they wore. Um, and uh, they were in chest deep water. This particular trial had some of the largest changes in cardiovascular fitness, VO2 max, of any of the trials I have done. And I think it was because the water medium adds a resistance that adds a challenge. Um, in this trial, it was really, really low intensive. When you were in the community center, you get a free person as a lifeguard, because they always have a lifeguard. So you have one person up there. We had one person on the deck who could see everybody very, very easily. And we had one person in the water. So really low intensive. I wanted to do this uh, trial at my own site, because we have a therapeutic pool. But they couldn't bring the temperature down because these patients are sweating in the water. They are working so hard. And our, our pool in our hospital is very, very hot and it would have been quite unsafe. Now, um, a graduate student with me um, from Iceland actually worked on this trial. And she went back to Iceland where they have now developed a whole new rehab center with a cool pool which they are using uh, for exercise. Uh, so I think there are different models that can be used. I mean, we've always used, in most rehab hospitals, our hot pool as a kind of a therapeutic medium, but not exercising intensively like this. So this was, again, a very low resource one. The only adaptation that we needed, you really need to have water shoes. 
um, because they're in, what we found is without the water shoes, our, our patients would slip or they would go around in circles too much. But they would play tag, we would do games of tag, which they thought was really fun. They, um, it was very, very safe because we could watch people. We had one person who had never swam before. Uh, it took a little bit to get him into the water and feel comfortable. Um, but they're not swimming. They're not swimming. They're, they're walking, they're stepping sideways, they're hopping, whatever they can do in to get their heart rate up. This is the dose trial that we are just embarking on, uh, funded uh, from the, uh, the Heart and Stroke Partnership and Stroke Recovery. Uh, it is, uh, has three groups. Uh, one is usual care, um, regular therapy, which is generally uh, one hour, five times a week. And this is the, the four-week inpatient rehab. We're also monitoring them to see what intensity they receive. The moderate intensity one is the same rehab physical therapy, but we are replacing it by a protocol that tries to get them to 60% heart rate reserve. We have targeted progression of steps and functional exercises, monitoring them for all sessions. I really hope this middle one works. Because if this one works, it'll be really, well, fairly easy to implement in our current practice setting. But I don't know. The high intensity is the same as the middle one, but we're actually adding on an additional hour. I have no doubt this one will work. But whether this one could be implemented or not, it would be a really tough sell in our current uh, environment. Uh, we're doing this uh, trial at, uh, in Vancouver at GF Strong Rehab Center. Holy Family is another rehab center. Uh, the two uh, rehab centers in Calgary and Toronto Rehab Institute uh, in uh, Toronto. So we're just pilot testing someone this week at our site and hope to start randomizing and uh, recruiting formally in January. So just as my uh, last uh, summary slide, uh, we know activity intensity is low rehabilitation and declines further in the first year post-stroke. We really need to figure out how we can monitor intensity as part of current practice and feed that back to the therapist and feed it back to the patients as well, whether it's heart rate, whether it's repetitions or the perceived exertion. We need to be innovative about the type of methods to increase rehab. We really are not likely to see more hours of one-on-one -on -one therapy today um, but we can think of doing more group programs and certainly probably at your centers and our center we are already doing inpatient group programs and we will see an increase in that. Uh, circuit training, more self-managed programs and working with caregivers and their families as well. Uh, lastly, some aspects of the cardiac rehab model may be appropriate for stroke, not only in the types of exercise they do, but perhaps in the, the payment plan as well in that Maybe it's less intense, but we incorporate more of the caregivers and whatnot and stretch out that intensity uh, to one year so that we actually reduce or prevent the decline that we know happens uh, in that first year post-stroke. So lots of different ideas um, that we can move forward with and certainly no shortage of research to be done. Just like to thank you for listening and our, certainly our sponsors, CHR Heart and Stroke and the Michael Smith Foundation. Thank you.